Today's guests are Robert Gallant and Marshall Button, both of the Hubcap Comedy Festival fame. It's in its 18th year now. Happens in Moncton, happens in February. The roster that they speak about is very impressive. It's huge, in fact. Logistics, phenomenal. And at some point, maybe we should wake up to the economic driver it also represents. Because the business of being funny could be a growing business for New Brunswick. In the meantime, we can ask the question, where is New Brunswick's funny bone? Is it Moncton? Some say Miramichi. Who knows, maybe you know where it is. Or maybe you have a really good joke about New Brunswick you'd like to post on our Facebook page. Either way, enjoy the conversation with Marshall and Robert. So thanks for doing this. Appreciate you're really busy, to you. No problem. Yeah, we're in the last two week stretch, so things get uh, things get busier and busier. But that's that's good problems to have. Yeah. So. so you've got what sixteen artists in one language and twelve in another language. Like yeah. Yeah, there's a total of thirty artists coming this year. It's our, actually our, our biggest roster of comedians coming in. Um, that we've ever had so yeah it's uh, it's gonna be a lot of fun but we had some new venues added this year so a couple of extra shows so we needed to get some extra bodies in to good to fill it out so good yes well um, a big thing is uh, the geographical uh, reach of this uh, when we started uh, we were kind of an offspring of what was down, downtown Moncton uh, Centreville Inc and it was myself and my friend Ken Kelly, who was the executive director of Downtown Moncton at the time. Uh, I thought well, we should have something for the winter. You know, at the time there was a major uh, festival in the fall. The wine festival was just about getting started, and there was a big music thing happening at at one time. And uh, but what's happened, of course, we still our center. We're we're talking now from the center of Downtown uh, Moncton, and within striking distance of this. Of this house we're in, um, there are probably uh, within a five-minute walk, I'd say five or six, six different venues. Venues. So downtown Moncton is a center, but gosh, we've we're up at a place called the Igloo, and it's not quite in uh, the North Pole, but uh, we we have uh, now Shediac this year. We moved there, so we have venues in all three of the uh, municipalities that make up Greater Moncton. Uh, Dieppe, uh, Riverview, and Moncton. So uh, we're spread all over, you know, just kind of like a bad flu. <laughs> right time of year to have a bad, bad flu. Yeah. No, so yeah, I mean, with the different venues, it's great because a lot of people, there's a lot of people that love coming to downtown, but by having these neighborhood pubs involved, it's some people that just want to, you know, stay in their neck of the woods or it's a cheaper cab ride or that kind of thing. So yep. it's, it's worked out well having these satellites Yep. Uh, in our, in the different communities, and, but downtown, of course, always remains the hub. We do our the big shows at the Capitol Theater, and then with some of the downtown venues. It's one of my favorite complaints I've gotten over the years was somebody who was in trying to get into shows downtown, and they called me up all frustrated, like I've been to three bars and I couldn't get into any of them. What kind of <laughs> festival are you running? I'm like, oh well, apparently a popular one because you can't get into any of the shows. So, so yeah. that's great, and we worked on people buy earlier and earlier every year because they know. If you don't get out early and get your tickets, it's it's hard to get a seat, which is a, again good first world problems to have for yeah. a festival. So. Yeah. It, yeah, it must be striking for you to because you're giving us today's version, so it must be striking to see the growth rate and and it's for humor and it's in February and you would think it's fighting um, not all the obstacles, but it's you created something that didn't exist before, sort of not against all odds, but it, it's atypical, you know. Well, what's what's interesting is the first few years of the festival, we would not struggle, but it wasn't as easy to fill a roster, even though we didn't have as many shows, uh, because the scene wasn't as big. So as I mean, it was not it's not due to our festival, but the number of people who are getting into the business, who are trying their hand at stand up, an example being one thing that's been consistent from year one is the contest so uh, first it was just english and now we have both contest both on the francophone anglophone side and same sort of thing you'd have three or four people that someone told them they were funny in the <laughs> lunchroom at work or some people were you know kicking the tires of it so to speak yeah. but to get 10 people would have been a struggle 
and uh, we, we, you know, even though we, we limit it to 10 participants, we have to now narrow down from what this year? We are record-breaking 34 on the English side entries to get into the contest. <laughs> but it's really come from, like you said, people who are just trying it out to now people that are coming into our open mic are, they've been trying it out for a couple of years now in St. John, in Fredericton, in Moncton, all around the Maritimes. And they're coming here because this can really put them on the map. It's getting yeah. them recognized. We have probably four or five people who've won in past years who are now doing it professionally. Okay. So they've really taken it serious. It's not just, you know, the bragging rights of, you know, I'm the funniest guy at the kitchen table. It's, <laughs> no, no, they're, this is a stepping stone for them and it's really made an impact on where their career can go because they have this credential behind them. Yeah, right? yeah I mean, it was like uh, Julian Dion, who was, I just saw was uh, performing in Fredericton on uh, some pub on the north side or whatever. I saw a poster at Irving the other yeah. day when I was coming back. He's a former winner. He lives in New York. Or, I don't he's, in, he's in uh, Gatineau now. But yeah, he, he, he lived in New York, New York City, City for a while. while doing comedy there, and now they're in the Ottawa area. Yeah. And uh, then Peter White's another Peter one. Peter White's somebody who's really come along. Like this past year with his set that he did at the, Hall or, sorry, the Winnipeg Comedy Festival, which is televised, that became CBC, um, the network, it became their number two video of the entire year. Wow. Like millions of hits yeah. on his on his set. So like that that alone <laughs> has brought him up to another level of exposure. And yeah, and he started out entering our contest, you know, yeah. uh, 20 years, I don't know, 15 years yeah, ago. <laughs> yeah, close to 15 years. So Well, well the next step then will be an entrepreneurship program or an apprenticeship program right. with NBCC about uh, coming to New Brunswick and develop a career in comedy. <laughs> well, it's, you know, we have a few people now where... Uh, I'm thinking, I mean, I mean, this is on the stand-up side, but of course, uh, James Mullinger, who's going to be part of our festival this year, who the first, after, just after he moved to New Brunswick, you know, we brought him right into our festival and he was part of the first Sim Funny show and did some stand-up uh, around uh, venues. But then we have Nikki Payne, who, you know, is originally from Nova Scotia, who's known around the world, but she lives in Grand Berrichois, just half an hour away. So interesting things have happened uh, in the fall, she had the idea of, of trying to um, to do uh, this project to uh, mentor and uh, encourage uh, women to do stand-up. And so she did for eight women, and it was a great success. Uh, the show that we had at the Empress Theatre, we just couldn't squeeze any more people in. And yeah, their graduation when Marshall and I were running around putting out extra chairs, and yeah, we had like 200 people at least in there yeah. to come out and support these women who had just done the course, and they, they really, should, they worked hard, and it was a great show. Yeah, and, so... And at least half of them are in the contest I wondered year. about so, that, yeah, yeah. So we got a good turnout from them coming out and, and uh, giving you a shot to take it further to that next level so. yeah so uh and who knows you know where that'll lead and now of course nikki's doing another program open to both men and women so uh yeah. so um and and uh wearing all the hats that i do you know the <laughs> the name hubcap well the hub used to be the the nickname for moncton and cap being the capital theater and so we adopted the hubcap the actual car hubcap as the yep. as the name or the the, the symbol of the it mascot. yeah, yeah. But um, where we have a, our theater academy, where we offer courses for, P yes, uh, young students, but also adults, you know, we were able to partner the two organizations and use our, our um, network and our marketing and, and run it through so we could use the venue of the Capitol to run that program. And great. it's a great profile for the, for the Capitol as well as our festival. Okay. So listening to the legacy of the development of new comedians, maybe we'll do a, a customized license plate one day. It'll say laugh in this place instead of be in this place. There you go. <laughs> Take over the province. <laughs> um, but I mean, one of the things too is you're saying like the development of being able to attract people to the festival. I remember I, I came on in year three and, um, and of course coming from a social work and a policing background, like really not... <laughs> Yeah. But, I, but I had run a lot of stuff when I was working at the YMCA, so I'd been, you know, running events, but not, not cultural, whatever. But yep. So that just finding, okay, how do we find the comedians and reaching out and at that point is using a lot of middle people. So it was like taking extra steps and, and it was really just like, would you please come to our festival? Like <laughs> trying to find people at that stage and, yep. and, and getting it together. And now to the point where, you know, we got to select, you know, 15 to 20 English comics, for example, but I have 80 plus applications that want to come here every year because everybody's fired in. Yeah. You know, it's, we've developed a name. We treat people like gold when they're here, like that whole maritime hospitality thing. And, yeah. and the audiences are so warm here too. It's, 
Yeah. I've been in clubs sometimes in the bigger cities, and you always have that guy, arms folded, like, yeah. make me laugh. <laughs> and, and Test, just, testing, yeah. Yeah, so the guy's whole thing is like, can I make that one guy laugh? <laughs> but <clears throat> here, honestly, people are laughing when they come in the door. Like, it's February. They're just happy to be out yeah. and that these people came here too. <laughs> to, so it's, it's a much warmer audience and a really good time. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and an interesting development that you know we now we are now we've become the agency, right? We yes, we are, are uh, an organization that has a number of uh, comedians that we can recommend and uh, book, you know, for events and organizations and uh, you know clubs. Uh, but the other interesting thing about New Brunswick, uh, even though the audiences are great, the population isn't. So when we do things like, uh, for example, we do a for the first 10 years of the of the festival the the genesis of it we used to do these two reviews we started with the english and then there was the acadian review and each of them would play during the festival that was a big part of it but then they would tour all over the province because they had to like if you wanted to do more than one or two shows yeah uh you really you know kind of had to spread it around and so that as a result of that the brand got around to places like Dalhousie, St. John, uh, uh, Grand Falls, uh, you know, Woodstock, uh, uh, Bristol. Yeah. <clears throat> and so now people will make this the destination, even though we're not, you know, we do other tours. We've done, you know, at least one tour a year, I believe every year of the festival. But um, we, um, you know, we're getting it around the whole province so that the province is now aware of this. Uh, They'll come to Munkin for the show, so we're getting yeah. a good... And I mean, everybody from up north pretty much has family in town, so yeah. yes, it does pick up the hotel industry as well too, but a lot of it, you can't really track that way because it's they're coming from, especially on some of the big francophone shows, they're all coming from the peninsula, coming down and they're staying with family and, yep. and going to the shows. So we track that by looking at where the ticket sales are coming from. But it's been really interesting that it is turning into a bigger and bigger tourist attraction yeah. in the middle of winter. But Monk can also, in, so you're going to watch shows and go shopping, right? So well, no, to... the real reason they're coming is because their family have electricity. Yes, yes. Exactly. <laughs> and they're coming to get warm up and be able to cook things. Exactly. That was the case last year. Oh, my God. What yeah. Schmazel there. That was a tough year for yeah. the peninsula. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. The, uh, your story parallels Walter Learning's interview on the early days of TNB uh -huh. and how he had to travel around and travel around and, and get uh, for a number of people in seats. So you got to go to those venues mm -hmm. to play so they get to know who you are. And so that's uh, maybe that's one of those development stories that could be boosted into other sectors. That well, it's if, very it's you know, it really is the only province. I mean, you know, the only province that is like that, because even sh even PEI which the whole province has the population of Greater Moncton. Yeah. But for the months that the entertainment scene is active, the population quadruples or you know, because of all the tourists yeah. and, and all the tours coming. So they can run something like Anne of Green Gables or Mamma Mia the next big it. musical, yeah. you know, yeah. all you know, for three or four months and draw on that. But you know, in, ha in Nova Scotia, you have Halifax, uh, even Newfoundland, like St. John's is big enough. It's that much bigger than, and really, even though the Moncton now is the biggest city, it's interesting because of the English-French split, mm -hmm. it's it's pretty tricky to be able to have a show that you could hope to present more than one or two nights and draw a crowd. Now, we managed to do that with uh, the musicals that we're now doing, but uh, it wouldn't happen if you didn't have francophones coming to an English show. And that happens a lot with us too. It's, yeah. a, it's interesting. And I think even with your musicals, a lot of it is tourist travel. Like people are coming in. It's the big musical production in the province, really. So yeah, yeah. you've got St. John and Fredericton coming down. And a little bit, yeah. And that kind of thing. It, it, yeah, it's always that thing. Like I remember you telling stories about being in Ontario and, oh yeah, we did the same show like seven nights in a row. Yeah. That's really hard to pull off in Moncton just because, you know, yep. population, et cetera. Yeah. So it's, it's, and that's, that's the whole thing. Why it really is, you take the whole population of the province is equivalent to Hamilton, Ontario. And once again, so 35% are French speaking. But of that, like when we get some of these Quebecois stars, there's ma there are many local people who don't understand what the heck they're saying any more than an, a total <laughs> Anglophone, you know, non-French non person would yeah. because of the speed, yeah. the dialect, 
Uh, so there is that combination of people from outside, the people from Montreal who have a certain Quebecois flair, and the homegrown Acadian talent that everyone understands. You know, even potentially some English-speaking people. So yeah. it's um, it's yeah. yeah. But we're fortunate. I mean, we've grown this. It started, like you said, with just a few shows. So we didn't become yeah. a thirty-show event over the week, like from those days it was like a few bar shows and one or two theater shows like we yeah. really have grown this but the crowds i mean the, the supporters have followed like they've really they've made it the success that it is that we can add just a little bit change a couple things here and there but you know from the early days of like say there was 10 shows to now the fact we're doing 30 shows it's you know that's been an interesting road to how yeah. we get there yeah. and how we brought the fans along do you think that comedy has something to do with that Oh, yeah. Because it's your product, but comedy is special. It's kind of like music, you know. Comedy brings something out in people, and it unites people. Well, in the fact, I mean, it's one thing I learned from Marshall right away. Like as, as we started with the talent agency, and but who we're bringing in was we've always been very careful about quality. Hmm. That's what he always from the first time I started. He's like, it's all about we have to bring in the best of the best. So like we're at, it's an all headliner festival kind of thing. Like the people you're seeing are tried and true, and they're mm -hmm. they're selling across the country. They're working all the clubs. That kind of thing. So there's, there's that quality side. So some people are buying to go to a bar show. They don't necessarily, it's kind of the curse of being a Canadian entertainer. Yeah. They'll recognize the face, but they don't necessarily know the name. But they've gotten to the point that they trust that Hubcat's bringing in top quality. So there, there's yeah. that part of those of people that are buying. And the other, like you said, just the fact that it's comedy, but they get to see so many different people. Yeah. It's not the same three people all weekend. You know, they've got a huge selection and people yeah. buy multiple shows and they're planning out, how do I get to see everybody? I'm going to go to that bar, then I'm yeah. going to go to that bar. then yeah. you know. So they're going out three nights out of the week to see our shows, it, which is a you know, big commitment. Yeah, and the, the other interesting thing about New Brunswick is you, know, you hear about, oh, it's all old people, we have an aging population. <laughs> That's true to a large extent. Yeah. Um, and working as I do, you know, doing the same friggin' show for 30-some years, <laughs> and also being involved at the Capitol, where we have a lot of shows, where there's nice seats and... You know, you'll look into a crowd, for example, that's Symphony New Brunswick, and there may be four or five hundred people there, but you could count on one hand the number of people under the age of thirty or even forty. But what's happening? Not so much at the Capitol; the shows there, but around the bars, you go there and you think we do have young people in New Brunswick. They're not getting involved in service clubs like they would have thirty, forty years ago. They're not involved in philanthropic causes as much you don't see them you know on the boards of the united way or things but they're here and they need to be entertained and a lot of what is driving their laughter is in the palm of their hands and in some cases they know these comedians because they've seen bits of theirs or whatever mm -hmm. so there's a real appetite for it but it's so refreshing that we're doing something that gets people out of their wherever the heck they are, yeah. to congregate together and come and laugh together out loud. Yeah. As opposed to laughing silently into your little screen, you yeah. know, or it, and sharing it with friends like we do now. Hey, look yeah. at this or whatever. Yeah. yeah. And that's what I mean by the magic of it. Because like music, when everybody sings along the songs, when the band plays the favorite tune for the audience and they have that moment, comedians might not have um, all the marketing and positioning that music does. But there's moments when everyone's laughing so hard, they mm -hmm. just can't stop. And that's transcendent. Like something special happens in that room when that comedian or comedian has everyone in that space. Yeah. Yeah, there's a whole interesting thing because there's the personality of the performer and there ends up being a definite personality of a an group audience. of an audience. Yeah, every audience. And like, you know, Robert can tell you from going around, you stick your head in here and it's the same <laughs> comedian who's doing the same routine that he did in Riverview an hour before and now you're across the river or you're in Dieppe or, you know and you're you're witnessing this and it's a completely different reaction because I don't know it, it sometimes take you know I usually I always say like the optimum is about 150 like you know in a theater uh, or in a club you need about 80 the, uh, people like if it's a small venue so people need to be close like if their shoulders are touching it's it's better so we, you jam them in and somebody starts to laugh <laughs> and <laughs> it's, 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 we are pretty much just like sheep right like yeah. one person starts and then the shoulders moving and oh and then it, it's yeah. infectious yeah. 
And then also the other thing is, and this is a good thing about February, I guess, it can't be too hot. People don't laugh as much when they're really hot. So uh, I always look, and it needs to be dark, which is why we always make sure that we can have the spotlight on the on the performer and there's a certain anonymity so we're all in here like we're all in this little room in the dark together and then one person starts to laugh and if you have three or four really good laughers yeah. they carry just as three or four comedians can carry a whole well, I've been at some shows where there's not those belly laughers in the room and people are having fun but they're laughing behind their hand and because they're like they don't have permission to laugh out loud yeah but once you get two or three of those belly laughers going and everybody's like we're allowed to laugh out loud and yeah. then they just let it go because yeah. it's i feel bad for the comedians sometimes because they think they're up there dying yes but it's like no no they're enjoying the show they just don't know they're allowed to laugh like yep. so you got to get that out and once it starts it just rolls in waves right like it, it is a weird thing because you know why is it that humor is such an important tool like i remember i was listening to an interview the other day where, um, well, it was this, uh, I just started watching this, this Jerry Seinfeld that we must have, everybody watches that they're comedians in cars getting coffee. coffee. Yeah. So he's with Trevor Noah <laughs> mm -hmm. and he's talking about, Trevor Noah's talking about his father during apartheid days when this policeman, a white policeman on a horse is ready to bash him across his head and his father makes a joke and, you know, diff, you know sort of diffuses the tension and makes the, he said there's a moment where he's making this white police officer laugh and the guy says okay you guys go ahead there and he had want that from the moment he's about to bash him so what the power of humor can do hmm. yet it's not taught in schools it's somehow suppressed as if it's a bad thing he like was some, the class clown yeah right? somebody so. laughs and they're being strapped for it or they're told Shh, don't laugh when laughter is as natural as really breathing, in fact, laughter is known to be yes. the number one, uh, you know, booster of your immune system more than any drug or anything you can take. Yet somehow it's suppressed so that you do have people going laughing, and their 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 instinct is to stop themselves, because for whatever stupid reason, as young people, they've been told it's not good to laugh, yeah. which is totally counterproductive to a good life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So one of your next tags for promoting is you could have uh, your logo fellow whose name I'm blanking on now. What's your Roly? Roly. Yeah. Roly could be wearing a stethoscope and uh, you know a medical thing and saying, "Hey, come for your health." Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> yeah, no, we we have uh, used that in the past about you know uh, the uh, laughter being good medicine and uh, yeah. Do you have a for instance of a show where um, it? It was so exceptional I mean, over the years. And it's not to pick one over anyone else, but there's always moments in a performance where something kind of happened and it stays with you. Like a well, there was that time that guy in the wheelchair got up and walked. But other than that, I mean, <laughs> there is healing power. No, <laughs> no, but there, I mean, there are some, some guys who, like Patterson who's coming this year, for example. Yeah. Um, it's come up to a, from a couple bars that I was talking with this year when I'm dropping off tickets. And they're commenting back when the days when Steve was coming out and performing all the bar shows, not just a theater show, yep. that there was this group of people that just followed him from show to show to show because he was, he's so good, like he's mixing up his shows, he's not always doing the same material. Yeah, he's got something. But like there'd be 30 people show up behind him, watch his set, he'd get off stage and they'd leave with him and the bar's like, are you staying to see the other one? No, we're going to go see Steve again. <laughs> like there's some people that just have that charisma and attraction yeah. that they're going to like, it's interesting behavior that you see sometimes come out just because, like, and they'll go and they'll watch them and they'll just lose their minds all over again, like, just, just <laughs> split in the gut. Yeah, I really like the ones who, I, you know, it's it's wrong to say that they don't have a set. They they have it, but it changes so much. Like, a guy, Joey Elias, who's yeah. been many times, and he comes. And his thing is he just talks to people in the crowd. Mm -hmm. And and then they'll they'll answer something, and then that gets him thinking about, a funny thing he may have said in a bit last year or whatever. Years ago. And he, he kind <laughs> he of so much stuff. And he just reworks it like that. Yeah. Uh, this uh, Mark Forward's another one where he yeah. has routines, but they're so out there, like they're so different from a normal stand up. And you know, the guys who you go and not to knock them, but I mean, they're doing every syllable the exact same yeah. when they're in one or the other. Uh, and people like it. But for my money, those are the moments that really stick out with me. And it, it, it really is like you're watching a play 
and an actor falls down when they're not supposed to, or somebody um, you know trips over their uh, uh, their lines or they dry as you call it, they fr- and they yeah. hate it, but the audience loves it, and that's what they remember because it's real. Yes, and it it you know that it is an unrehearsed moment <laughs> that someone and we like to watch other people suffering. And it's kind of like it's kind of like that's the basic humor, you know the. The, the guy slips on a banana peel or the coconut falls on the right. caveman's head and then they laugh mm-hmm. at it. Yeah. And that's primi- you know, that's as primitive again. But really, the great comedians are out there without a net. And when they're doing that, you go, wow, this could go any way here. <laughs> yeah. And sometimes, it, most of the times it works, but the odd time, it gets a little awkward. Well, yeah, it's, it's up to how the performer deals with it. Like, mm-hmm. do they freak out and leave the stage? I mean, I've seen it happen to Marshall <coughs> during Lucien. He's in his fishing shanty and he's, really eating a, a salmon sandwich on stage and he chokes on it in front of him. <laughs> and he's like, I'm like, I worry, do I have to go up and do the Heimlich maneuver? Yeah. He finally coughs it up. The audience is losing their mind. Yeah. <laughs> Marshall just makes a couple more jokes about it and carries on. But, yeah. you know, it, it could have been a serious moment in yeah. the play, but it turned out to be yeah. like this hilarious addition to the show, right? Yeah. So. Your story reminds me a bit of uh, when John Candy passed away. They had some of the gang from SCTV reminiscing about when he auditioned. And there had so many people coming to the auditions, they paired them up two at a time and said, okay, do 30 seconds or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I think it was Eugene Levy who was saying that, well, here's this big fella and then this little guy. And the little guy hugged the stage the whole time. They were supposed to be throwing back and forth. None of that. And so Candy just kind of went, fine, you you hold court. Blah, 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 blah. And he stood behind him and started making faces like it's yeah. making faces behind <laughs> the teacher. Yeah. Yeah. He had them on the floor for the 30 seconds or minute that they had. He said, Levy said, when we all got together for some beers afterward to talk about what we'd watch, because we were exhausted, you watch all these people coming through, and yeah. you can't remember anyone. But there was this big guy, and this big guy didn't say a darn word, and he had us on the floor. And that was his audition experience. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Could take the moment, adapt to it, and be funny with mm-hmm. it. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it, it's interesting because there's that, that weird thing that happens in a person's brain where... If sometimes if you're trying too hard, you'll never get there. It's being in a total blissful blank state that you're relaxed enough that you are comfortable with silences, Mm -hmm. that you are okay with just things kind of not being funny for a moment so that it can be super funny later on, if you follow me. Another favorite, and uh, he was here last year and many times, is this Derek Sagan, who we've taken and toured around. But... Again, you can watch him, and yeah, he has his bits, but he's so on and he's so different each time he does it that uh, you can just see there's a, there's a, there's a level of relaxation that he has that he's he's in his comfort zone, you know. Well, that tour that we did with him in the spring, he had um, a bit about on his trip to Jamaica with his with his girlfriend who gets motion sick. That started out as a seven minute bit on night one of the tour. By the ninth show, it was a 25-minute piece in the show. Like, it grew <laughs> just over the course of four or five weekends. It grew into, like, half the show because yeah. it just kept going and going. Oh, I'll try this piece in here. I'll try that and yeah. adds it up. And, you know, how do you turn seven minutes into 30? Well, <laughs> you do it every night or for a period of time. Yeah, and yeah. Then there are the rare breed who, you know, as the expression goes, they're writing on their feet. Yes. You know, yeah. so much of this, like, people think, oh, you just get up there and tell jokes and... Well, it's not. Like most people spend a lot of time crafting it and then they go out to these these clubs that they're trying new material so that when they come to this festival, uh, they have their routine down pat. Or in some cases, in some of the obscure little bars, they'll go off on tangents and trying things. But you really can, can spot the ones who are writing as it's coming out, which yeah. is a pretty pretty unique gift. Yeah. So can we talk a bit about this year's show? Can you walk us through... You know, some of it, uh, we'll put the website uh, on our links and yeah. such, and, and uh, the cast of characters, English and French, that you've got coming. Yeah, so uh, each year in the festival, we try to do things a little bit different. I mean, there's a lot of the tried and true, this works, so don't break it in terms yeah. of what we do. But make sure we have a good mix of returning comics, so people who've become fan favorites, so to speak, sure. as well as always making sure we're bringing in new blood. So our new partnership with Sirius XM, for example, uh, they have a big contest they run every year called Top Comic. So it's who's the best comic in Canada, and the winner gets $25,000, and, and of course a lot of airtime and exposure. So we look at working with them. We make sure we bring in 
some of the people that have you know been runner ups or winners in past years. And we'll get into the habit of so this year, Gavin Matz is coming in. He's the winner from this year, so we'll make sure that we're always bringing in the winner from that, so that you know we're getting that's great. You know, who's the hottest person on the block right now? Make sure that we're we're getting them yeah. in. So that's a new component because of our partnership with SiriusXM, but it, it, it certainly helps out because they're actually recording some of the shows here. So our comics then get um, more exposure across the country, which helps turns into them for corporate gigs, et cetera, because more people are listening to them. Yeah. Um, one of the changes we're doing too, so we have our Thursday Night for Last show, and that's like an all-star gala where you get, usually you get like eight comics and a, and a host. So we've had different hosts in the past, like Mike Bullard and Candy Palmiter, you know, different people who are taking care of the evening, but we've got all these other comics on the show. One of the new things we're doing this year, because we have Steve Patterson coming back, and it's been a long time since we've had him, we're actually doing five or six comics in the first half of the show, and then Steve gets the whole second hour by himself. So instead of him being a host, let him stretch his legs, because he's... You know, he is a huge favorite here and he's got a, a lot of stuff to do. So we're just kind of changing up the format a little bit. Fun. But a lot of people, we still wanted to have a bunch of comics on the show because a lot of people Thursdays where they go and like, they kind of pick who their favorites are and then make sure they see their full sets in the bars because they're doing seven to 10 minutes at the Capitol, but they get to do a full 30 in the bars. So they'll kind of pick their things out that way. Um, on the Francophone side... You know, we also looking at, as we said, sometimes it's hard for people, like, if they don't know them, like, they might be a superstar in Quebec, or a rising star in Quebec, more likely, yeah. that isn't as well known here. We have to go after that superstar level. So this year we have Jean-Michel Antille. We went on sale in September, and with only some Facebook notification, we sold half the show by the end of September. Like, it was a pretty big mark difference, like, when you bring in that right name kind of thing. Wow. But with uh, with working with Jasper on on bringing down some of the partnering on some of the Quebec artists that are coming in and and of course the big sponsor with that side is um, the uh, Rendezvous um, de la Francophonie. So it's it's an organization that promotes um, you know French shows and culture across the country. So mm-hmm. so they're taking it across the country. So when they come here, they're working with us. But it's great that we're able to bring in. Some of those rising stars from Quebec, the up and comers, who are going to do bar shows as well, so they get exposed to a broader audience. Yeah. But for the first time, we really have a, a bigger conduit for up and coming Acadian stand ups. So we've done the review in the past, but that's more sketch comedy. This allows, is allowing this development of, of our stand up comedy. And because of the connection with some of the agents coming from Quebec, it's turned into some of these guys actually getting to go and start working the Quebec circuit. Like Julien Dion last year we did our bilingual gala for the first time. And so we had him in it. He was, you know, he was nervous. He was scared. He had to write and cause he's French first, but he's never performed in French. He's only performed in English. Oh my. He's gotten that start on that side. Yeah. So this was the push he needed to get going on it. Um, did a really good job, impressed people. And now Francois, they're doing some tours in Quebec. He's hired him to go tour with him in French. So it's opened up a whole new career market for, for Julien, who started out winning the open mic, you know, grinding it through, went and lived in Toronto, lived in New York, like working all those clubs and hustling and yeah. getting his time up. And, uh, you know, things are now starting to to advance to that next level. And, and a lot of that is because we're able to help make connections for some of those up and coming. Uh, of course, he didn't mention Tom Green, who's the big star who's coming this year. So that's our Saturday night show on the first weekend of the festival. And uh, interestingly, like we, you know, the the thing is, it's a comedy festival, so we, we want people to come and have a show and laugh. There's a lot of people who think, oh, Tom Green, I'm not going to go to that because I watched his show and he's going to eat a raccoon on stage or whatever. <laughs> but the thing you got to realize is we wouldn't have booked him if he didn't have an act. Like he's a stand-up comedian who's plying his craft constantly. That's what he's been doing most of the time since his movies and his TV specials and his time on Donald Trump's Apprentice or whatever. That's been the constant with him. And he's a very good stand-up, and you will come and be entertained. Well, in fact, like he's right after the festival, he's got a, um, a, a long run starting in Vegas. He'll be doing a residency. a residency there. So, I mean, that doesn't come without actually being able to sell tickets kind of thing, right? Yeah. So he's got a solid act and, uh, you know, a really great performer. So we're really looking forward to that show. That's a great thing to capture because here's someone who's playing Moncton and then playing Vegas. 
And yeah. One of right. the things New Brunswick's got to catch on one day, like we're good. You know, you yeah. guys have created something that's good. And it's to that scale because the talent will want to come. We, we've got to get over that hump. The other thing that whistles through my head is New Brunswick hasn't had a, other than Marshall playing Lucien, uh, and maybe I'm missing it in, a, in, in Francophone community, but New Brunswick's got a funny bone, which is what we talked about last mm -hmm. time. But mm -hmm. it needs a critical mass of comedians to start poking fun at the politicians, to start poking fun at some of the things we do, mm -hmm. so we can laugh at ourselves a bit more. Because mm -hmm. that's the great pleasure that you bring when you do your Lucian, is that you're making us laugh at ourselves. Yeah. And, and, and there's so much raw material. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. It's, it really is. I think uh, I couldn't have imagined this much activity, you know, going on today. Like when we started, I couldn't have imagined it. So it's, it's refreshing. And uh, as Robert says, you know, you go to, there's a Yuck Yucks now in St. John. Uh, there are different venues. I know in Fredericton, certainly in Moncton, where on certain nights of the week you can go and there's these local comics who come out and uh you know will promote themselves or be promoted by the club and uh and you know sometimes it's pretty lousy stuff right <laughs> but it doesn't get to be good without keeping doing it and developing it. and the great thing about comedy is it's pretty easy to figure out what works and what doesn't you know either people laugh the or they immediate don't immediate <laughs> reaction yeah. and there are a few of them who'll stick with it god bless them yeah. after they bombed a few times you know but they're you know, eventually it's like water. It seeks its own level. And, uh, you know, good people uh, get better. And, uh, you know, people who are just starting out that have the potential can eventually get good as well, you yeah. know. And that's that's nice to see. Obvious question. But the, the cultural differences, the language differences, uh, is there a different sound to the laughter? Because the joke will be a bit different because of the cultural difference? I, I think that uh, certainly from my background of theater, um, the francophone is certainly much broader and the audiences are more robust and uh and interestingly because moncton is known as one of the places and they have the best audiences in canada okay. and i would say you know dalhousie new brunswick is another place no bias there no bias <laughs> right but not just for my stuff and cornwall ontario and different people who've played those places will tell you the same thing, whether they're doing something in French, in English, or a mixture of both. And I think it has to do with that French-English mix. I think it has to do with the fact of people who are kind of, you know, picked on a little bit because of their, uh, the way they speak or the being a, a minority or having to uh, live a little bit in an English world even though you're francophone. Uh, don't take themselves too seriously and are quick to laugh at something. Mm -hmm. So, as Robert mentioned, we started something last year. We thought, well, first time we'll do this Le Bilingual show. And uh, there's a young man who works at the Capitol. He teaches at our theater school and works in our box office. Recent graduate of Mount Allison. His name is Xavier Gould. And he developed this character, and it's hard to describe, but it's called Jacint Book. And Jacinth is like a valley, a Vicadian valley girl. Like, yeah. he, and, and it's, you got to check this on YouTube. And he's had all thousands of hits on this. So we have him as the host of the bilingual show. And it's opened the door to an entirely new audience. Yeah. And traffic we're generating with all the comments on social media. And the well, we actually, and we just sold it out at the end of last week. We, we finished selling out the show. We're at a, at a theater in Dieppe. So we have just over 200 people coming out. So yeah. it's going to be a good time. But yeah, the, the, the media, the, the, the comments and, and discussions on Facebook. Um, and we, we had just sent through some videos to... His shtick is kind of like complaining, like nothing's going my way, <laughs> nothing's good enough. And so we're having him host, and he's on there complaining, like, I the want to perform. I don't want to, like, I'm a comedian. Why am I hosting? I'm better than that. And <laughs> so it's just us then poking fun back at him. So, yeah. but it just builds up all these followers that are. <laughs> no, it's yeah, been a lot of fun. And he's, and he really, if you don't speak French, you can understand him because of the chiac. Yeah. yeah. But he's, uh, he's got some funny ones. Check him out on YouTube. Yeah. yeah. So it's we'll, great that he's. Uh, we'll connect that and put that in the show. Too. Yeah. We'll put the link down below. Yeah, you should. Yeah. Spread that around. Yeah. So, uh, in doing a bit of prep for the interviewing you guys, and, it, and it's raw material, it's like somebody should get hold of it. One of your sponsors is Org Organigram. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> My goodness. So, and it's the educational component. You've got to identify it on your website. 
So how much, you know, the, the raw material that could grow out of that? Would, well, yeah, speaking I mean, of raw material, material this, this is what we're giving to what the comedians <laughs> yeah. as part of their Welcome. kit. Yeah. I didn't know what it was, but I guess it's, it's a, a thing. No, you put your, whatever, you put your marijuana in there and then you <laughs> crash it or whatever, like to oh. put it in. No, I haven't had occasion to use it yet, but, <laughs> but uh, good on them, you know, like uh, yes. certainly yes. Uh, the comedians, so many of them, much of their material uh, revolves around um, um, just talking about smoking dope. So it's it's right, you know. And well, and once we pass that July first date, and we are we're into next year, yeah, we can do a four twenty show. We can do something tied in with them, and yeah. uh, but I mean, you know, they'll be there and they do some of the education component and that that stuff. That's great. Like in some ways, it's not just a joke because we know. They've just done a huge donation in terms of dealing with, even though it's not their side of the business, but the opiate crisis. Yep. Like they're giving kits out to all the frontline workers yep. that can deal with the noxaprone or whatever it is and deal with that. So, I mean, it is something that they take seriously. They're being good corporate citizens. Yep. And we're very happy that they're coming on board and working with us. Well, and plus, at the Capitol Theater, we are going to pump marijuana through the air right. exchange <laughs> system <laughs> during the show. Yeah. So that's a new feature this yeah. year. So yeah. make, get ready for the run on the munchies when people leave. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no more yeah. Pringles left at the bar. Yeah. We'll just be out there selling chips and pop. And, yeah. Yeah. But this is good to bring up because, like people being hesitant to laugh, they say we got to start opening up a lot of conversations about all the things that are possible and good and creative and actually make you feel at home. It gives you a sense of home because everyone knows where they fit. And mm -hmm. so when I read that, I saw our grandma and grandma, it's a comedy festival. To, oh, somebody's going to jump on this and have some fun running yeah. with it. But if we talk about it this way, too, it also gives context, professional, community based yeah. um, and go have your fun. Yeah, exactly. yeah, <laughs> yes. it's quite an operation. I did a Christmas show for them uh, that, uh, just in December, and uh, you know, at the casino there, they had their party, and what a serious bunch of friggin' <laughs> stick in the mud people! Like they, they really take their work to very seriously, and it, you know, that's that is a bit of a, uh, you know, people's preconceptions. Like you think if you were with a group of actors, you'd have a good time. Not no. like you want to hang out with like accountants and people who have like boring jobs in yeah. real life. Have more fun. Yeah, it's just the way it is. Kurt Vonnegut was once quoted as saying, "You want to learn to be a writer? Go to an engineer's convention." Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Be the only one of your type. In, yeah, in that, yeah, in that space. Uh, previous guest on the show, Niels Riemann, talks about uh, the growth of the cannabis industry in New Brunswick. He's on the medical side. Yeah. Um, was really looking for more cooperation from government and other businesses because if we. In his view, if we all work together on this, mm -hmm. um, New Brunswick can really make a huge leap forward in that particular sector, mm -hmm. rather yeah. than the traditional competitive method of making sure my competition does know everything I'm doing. So it might tie to some of the seriousness that yeah, yeah, went into it. And it's at the front end of a, a potentially big curve for all of them. Mm -hmm. So but anyway, I just thought Organogram Comedy Festival, perfect, too good, yeah. too good. Yeah. But we try to, with all of our sponsors, we try to make it more of a relationship, a partnership, as opposed to just here's a check. Yes. So like with our friends at BMW, they're in, but they give us cars to drive around. And it's funny, you always think, well, a vehicle is a vehicle, almost like we used to rent seven passenger vans. But even the bigger headliners that get picked up in a really nice vehicle, yeah. they notice the difference from they played at whatever festival down the road and they got picked up in somebody's broken down Chevette yeah. or whatever. But they're like, wow, this is really nice. Nice of... You know, so those things, but that's come from developing that relationship. So it's not just here's a check and a whatever. We, you know, we we develop the relationship, and then they're also at the capital shows, you know, being able to interact with uh, yeah, people not, coming yeah, yeah. in and our different clients. We find different angles for them to be able to yeah. actually be part of the festival, not just a yeah, check. Yeah, here's right? a check from me. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. We didn't uh, crash any BMWs yet, not on wood, but <laughs> with uh, all the snow, it's amazing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes. It's, it's worth almost as much as my house. I'm a little nervous sometimes <laughs> driving around. But, exactly. Uh, yeah, so. So, any yeah, no. any thoughts to wrap us up? Well, I guess uh, the, the 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 thinking being that uh, even though this takes place in February, like we hope that we're part of creating a, a culture that uh, promotes humor and laughter in people's daily lives. And it sounds a bit altruistic, and aren't we great? But you know what? I was doing the State of the Province event uh, last week, 
uh, in Fredericton and you know some of the organizers says oh this government they're very thin-skinned you know every time someone makes a comment we hear back and and they may not be you know ready to take a joke I mean I made my jokes anyway and they seemed to laugh and it was it was fine but uh, I think it's uh, when we witness what's going on uh, south of the border where um, everything is so-called uh, fake news uh, you know that everybody's an enemy if you're not just you know dealing with straight kind of pro- government propaganda which uh, you may or may not disagree with that it's a very healthy activity to to keep people honest to uh, to keep everybody kind of because the, yes it's funny and it's meant to laugh at but if you really think of why you're laughing it's because we're talking about the elephant in the room it's because we're exposing the foibles of what some high up person may have done and as soon as that right you know you can say oh we're we're a free country we can continue continue to do this but i'm not so sure now when you you know you're starting to see some of these trends and some of these so-called big democracies that are the model of the world so I think it's a it's something worth keeping and treasuring. And to follow that theme that you just pointed out, um, English Canada tends to adopt American values pretty quick mm-hmm. and sort of forget Canadian values. Yeah, because we're so influenced through American media. So there's you could argue there's been an erosion <clears throat> yeah. of what makes Canadian. And one of the things that makes us Canadian is how we laugh. Yeah, we laugh differently and have different sense of humor than the American version. So maybe humor. But there's a reason why so many of the biggest comics in the States have been Canadians over the years, too, yeah. because we're, we're exporting that ability or right to laugh at ourselves. And yeah. so some of them may not feel as popular. But yeah. I mean, you know, Plus, we have like, that kind of outsider's view of, yeah. you yeah. know, we're the, we're the kind of sitting on top of you looking down and uh, we're, we're looking you know, it threw the window at you, and then all of a sudden... But, but it's similar to how we always say, sorry, 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 yeah. sorry, that kind of narrative. So it might be that our sense of humor will help us remember to be Canadian while shifts in democracy and what is fake news or real news carry on in other places. Perhaps, yeah. Yeah, I think it mm-hmm. comes down to, yeah, not taking ourselves too seriously. So, yeah. I mean, being able to laugh at self-deprecating humor because we are, like you say, we always say sorry all the time because we're always... <laughs> but it is about the fact that, yeah, we can look inwards and we can like, oh, that, yeah, actually that is kind of ridiculous that I did that or said that or, and be able to, to laugh at that. And that's, you know, that's a big part of, of surviving, I think. You know, you can be angry all the time. There's lots of people who are angry all the time. They make a living at it. But how long are they going to live? Or how are they going to, yeah. you, know, you know what I mean? Like be able to step back and like, yeah, you know what? Let's let's laugh at our ridiculousness. And well, maybe if we crystal ball it ten years from now, we'll look back at this interview and see that you two were able to put the happiness index into the matrix of whether New Brunswick's a nice place to live. You know, either that or we'll be up on charges. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, me too. That'll be us. There, Robert will accuse me of sexual harassment. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't joke about that, but uh, you know, you never know. Yeah, you yeah. never know. Yeah. No. All right. Okay. Good. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you, and thank you for watching. Be good. Have fun. Love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to dennisatchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.